So let's begin with the first question. Why did ex-Confederates leave the South following the Civil War? Now, there are a handful of reasons why former Confederates fled the South for destinations in Latin America following the Civil War. People had multiple reasons for leaving, and each individual was unique in why they inevitably decided to leave. But I'm going to try to outline some of the common reasons I think that people decided to leave the South. The first being for economic reasons. When former Confederate soldiers returned to their homes, many found their plantations, businesses, and estates burned and looted. Some individuals who owned thousands of acres of land and hundreds of enslaved people prior to the Civil War were reduced to a seemingly homeless state. White Southern slave owners in particular saw billions of dollars that they had invested in the institution of slavery vanish in four years. On top of this, the South's economic system was in shambles. The Confederate currency was virtually worth nothing, and inflation made the cost of basic subsistence goods astronomically expensive. And so we all know how expensive eggs are right now, right? We see that in the news a lot. Well, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, a correspondent for the New York Times reported, quote, the people are loath to believe a thousand dollars of Confederate currency would buy a dozen eggs, end quote. So given the economic situation in the South, many people feared that if they remain, they would simply be unable to live. Uh, many were concerned that they would starve. In fact, famine throughout the South during the summer of 1865 and into 1866 was such a concern that various relief funds and commissions would be established across the country to aid needy Black and white Southerners. So all these factors convinced some that they had no economic future in the South. And many of the individuals who held this view used up their last bit of wealth to transport themselves and their families abroad in order to start new again. So next to economic reasons, there were political reasons. In the aftermath of the Civil War, Republicans enacted a legislative agenda that sought to grant and insulate African-American civil rights. For example, in 1866, Republicans passed a Civil Rights Act that declared all persons born in the United States, including former slaves, to be citizens. This would later be enshrined in the Constitution via the 14th Amendment. Also in 1866, Republicans passed a second Freedmen's Bureau bill that provided resources for the Freedmen's Bureau, which was in charge of providing aid and education to former slaves. Now, legislative action like this deeply troubled former Confederates because they believed that any socio-political and economic elevation of former slaves by the federal government would necessarily come at the expense of their own economic and political power. But early on, Former Confederates were hopeful that President Andrew Johnson would obstruct, if not outright, block the efforts by Republicans to elevate African Americans. Although Johnson had been supportive of abolishing slavery, he was ardently opposed to elevating former slaves to the status of citizens. Johnson did his best, especially in 1865, to obstruct Republican efforts to do so. For example, in late 1865, Johnson allowed former Confederates to hold political office in their representative states. He ordered a general amnesty, and he allowed these people to participate in the creation of new state constitutions in former rebel states. Such leniency by Johnson contributed to many former rebel states implementing what are called black codes. And these are basically laws that restricted, restricted black people's right to own property, conduct business, buy and lease land, and move freely throughout public spaces, and obviously it inhibited them from exercising their rights as citizens, namely voting. And so these codes essentially amounted to slavery without chains. Additionally, Republicans had, in early 1866, attempted to pass the Civil Rights Act, but Johnson vetoed the law, and it would not be until later in summer that Republicans possessed enough power to override Johnson's veto and put the measure into law. And so Johnson's leniency towards former Confederates and his efforts to obstruct Republicans' legislative agenda reflect a period that historians call presidential reconstruction. But all this would change with the Republican midterm victories in 1866. The Republicans won overwhelming majorities in both the House and Senate, putting them in a position to easily override any veto by President Johnson and assure that they could enact their legislative agenda that Johnson had previously obstructed. 
This was a setback for former Confederates who greatly feared that they would no longer have the same political power in the postbellum period as they had experienced before the war, because now Johnson was essentially powerless to shield them from Republicans' efforts to punish them and also elevate uh, African Americans. And they were certainly right to be fearful, where in 1867, Republicans passed a series of Reconstruction Acts, also known as the Military Reconstruction Acts, that rolled back much of what Johnson had done under presidential reconstruction to insulate former Confederates from the consequences of defeat. And so the Reconstruction Acts basically dismantled the former rebel-dominated governments that Johnson had allowed to be formed on his watch. They barred former Confederates from participating in the new constitutional conventions for the new state governments that were ordered to be formed. Also, any Southern state wishing to be readmitted to the Federal Union was now required to ratify the 14th Amendment, which granted voting rights to formerly enslaved people. And then perhaps most dramatic of all, the South was divided up into five military districts and occupied by thousands of federal soldiers, some of which were African Americans attached to the United States Colored Troops regiments. So with these developments, by 1867, many ex-Confederates saw themselves as conquered people with no rights who were being forced to live as equals among people who they formerly owned. This was enough reason for many to leave the South for destinations in Latin America. And in fact, between 2,000 and 4,000 former Confederates fled the South in 1867 alone for Latin America. And this really marks the peak year for uh, Confederate outmigration from the South. And see on the screen here, I have a, basically just a map of military reconstruction so you can see how the South was divided up into these military districts. And then on the other side of the screen, here's a circular letter um, that was distributed throughout South Carolina in 1867 as a broadside kind of a, a poster. And uh, the man who wrote this letter is one W.W. Laguerre. And basically in this letter, he's calling Southerners' attention to these Reconstruction Acts and what he sees as kind of the tyrannical reign of Republicans and the kind of new conquered status of Southerners in his view. And so if you read on, basically what he's calling for is Southerners to raise money so that he and friends can go investigate the conditions of Brazil and perhaps secure a track of land so that people can immigrate to it and kind of escape this new tyrannical rule of the U.S. federal government. And so similar broadsides like this circulated throughout the South during this time. But compounding the economic and political issues, many ex-Confederates fled the South for destinations in Latin America because they simply feared violent retribution from their neighbors. Such was the case in places like Missouri, where the fighting did not exactly include large-pitched battles, but was a more intimate combat between pro-Confederate and pro-Union neighbors that consisted of guerrilla-style warfare. Others feared that the federal government would confiscate their property and put them on trial for their part in the rebellion, which many feared would inevitably culminate in mass executions. Certainly, there were those in the country who believed that high-ranking officers and officials would be executed for their role in the rebellion, but this actually really never came to pass. In fact, only one former Confederate officer was executed after the Civil War, and that was the Swiss-born Henry Wirth who was convicted of war crimes for the atrocities he committed while in charge of the infamous Confederate prison camp at Andersonville, Georgia. Nonetheless, many feared that there would be droves of former Confederates taken to the gallows. Next to this fear, there was also racial fear. Many former Confederates, especially former slaveholders, feared that newly freed, and, uh, newly freed people might seek violent retribution against their former masters. They also believed that white women were no longer safe in the South with a free population of black men. And this fear emerged from this stereotype that was especially pervasive during the antebellum period, that black men in particular were kind of these sexual predators, and that if they were turned loose on the countryside, they would go on a mass raping and pillaging spree. And so this was a fear that had been pent up in former slaveholders in particular for generations and generations. And so these fears kind of compounded into this larger fear that a race war would soon break out and break out in the South, disrupting the unsteady peace in the few months following the U.S. Civil War. White Southerners were well aware of violence that could 
and had erupted in post-abolitionist societies. In fact, an extremely violent race riot had broken out in Jamaica in October 1865, known as the Morant Bay Rebellion between Black Jamaicans and British colonial authorities that caused much bloodshed. The rebellion was reported on thoroughly by American reporters, and former Confederates feared that the South would soon meet a similar fate. So fear and anxiety over racial unrest and potential race war was certainly a reason some decided to flee the South for Latin America. And then there are what I call the social cultural reasons that people left the South. Defeat in the Civil War had done much to damage white Southern men's sense of honor. Honor for white Southerners represented a code of ethics and behaviors that they needed to live up to to confirm their sense of self-worth and manhood, not just to themselves, but to their peers as well. White men could do this in a number of ways by demonstrating, one, financial, ind financial independence, two, a reputation for martial courage and strength, three, mastery defined as patriarchal dominion over a household of dependents, namely your wife, children, and certainly enslaved people, and four, a willingness to use violence to defend any affront or threat to themselves or dependents. But, con but, but Confederate defeat had convinced many that they had failed to live up to the principles of Southern honor. With the end of slavery and the near destruction of the South's plantation system, some believed it would be near impossible to reclaim their sense of honor by remaining in the South. So they figured that in Latin America, there were opportunities given the prevalence of agricultural industry and slavery, or at least non-white cursive labor systems. So they immigrated with hopes of reinvigorating their sense of honor and racial superiority that had been devastated by Confederate defeat in the Civil War. Now, all these reasons combined constitute some common motivations for ex-Confederate migration in the years following the Civil War. And it's important that we consider all these factors together because it's not really one thing that motivated Confederates to take such drastic measures. And even with these influences in mind, the choice to leave was not necessarily a clear cut for everyone. People deliberated their choice to leave the South or not for some time. There was even great debate in Southern newspapers over the issue. Some people went as far as to call the people that left the South cowards for abandoning, for abandoning the region in what they considered its most desperate time when it needed its sons the most. Nonetheless, thousands did immigrate. And there was a level of pull from Latin American nations themselves that really served to further convince many ex-Confederates that they should leave. 